Good morning to you, and welcome to Plain Edge Church. I'm so glad that you could join with us for this online service today. And this is a special day because this is Mother's Day. So I want to say Happy Mother's Day to all of our mothers. And Mom, if you're watching this, and I believe that you will be, I want to say Happy Mother's Day to you, and I love you very much. God bless you, and I hope that uh, it'll be a great and a wonderful day for you, as with all of our mothers. Well, today we're going to continue with the series that I began last week entitled, What Will Keep You Going? What Will Keep You Going? And of course, we're in a difficult time and uh, an unusual time. And uh, so this subject, I believe, will be one that's good for all of us. What will keep you going? The Christian life can be tough. It can be really tough. And no one understood this any better than Paul. Because the passage that we're going to look at today, Paul was waiting his execution in prison. He knew that his days were numbered. You know, all across the world in today's world, there are persecuted Christians uh, by the millions. In fact, according to Open Doors, which is an organization that uh, assists persecuted Christians around the world, in 2020... There are 260 million Christians which are in situations of high persecution. 260 million Christians. That represents approximately one in eight Christians across the globe. One in eight. And several years before Paul is going to talk about what we're going to talk about this morning... He was already under house arrest in Rome. And in the book of Philippians, addressing the uh, church at Philippi, he talked about what kept him going. And that theme in that book is all about joy. It was a prominent part of that letter to the church at Philippi. So it should be no surprise to us that as Paul's persecution intensified, that, uh, and as it worsened, that his joy became even stronger and more and more evident. What will keep you going? Joy. It kept Paul going, and it can keep you going and me going today. Let's look at the scripture, 2 Timothy chapter number 1. And Paul writes, I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience, as my forefathers did, as without ceasing... I remember you in my prayers day and night, greatly desiring to see you, being mindful of your tears, that I may be filled with joy. Notice that word joy. It's right there uh, at the conclusion of his comment, the word joy. You know, some things are essential. And that's a word I bet you've heard over and over and over again, essential. We hear it all the time now. But there have always been things that are essential in this world. And joy is one of those essential things. And it's one of those things that can keep you going and will keep you going. Why is that true? Why is joy an essential thing and something that can keep you going? Well... Joy is an expression of the heart. It is an expression of the heart. Uh, that's the deepest part of us, the innermost part of us, the heart. And joy expresses that. You know what expression means. We express ourselves every day uh, through the way that we look and that we appear. We express ourselves by the things that we say and that we do, our behavior. Uh, expression is all around us, and joy is an expression of the heart. Let's look at Philippians chapter 1. I made mention just a, a couple of moments ago how that when Paul was under house arrest, which was lesser than the prison that he's in now, he still showed much joy. At that time, he was able to have people come and go, and he entertained friends, and so it was a little bit uh, more relaxed and less severe at that time, but he was still under a house arrest. He was still in prison. Uh, he didn't have absolute freedom. And joy was a, a very essential part of his life at that time. In Philippians 1, 3, and 4, he writes, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. 
notice, making request for you all with joy. Uh, three things about joy. I'm sure there are more, but here are three things about joy that are good for us and can help us to understand how it can keep us going in our Christian life. First of all, let me say it is divine. It is divine. In other words, joy is based on our relationship with Christ. It's not really possible to have a deep-seated joy, a, an intense core joy, without having a relationship with Jesus Christ. But if you know Jesus Christ, if He is your Savior, He is your Lord, and you abide by His Word, and you love Him, and you know that He loves you, then that part about it being divine is substantial. And it assists us and helps us navigate through our life and keeps us going, and particularly when things are difficult. Not only is it divine, but it's not dependent on circumstances. Not dependent on circumstances. You know, circumstances come and go. Circumstances change. Sometimes circumstances are better. Sometimes they are worse. Uh, they go back and forth. But joy is not dependent on circumstances. Um, you hear a lot about happiness. And there are some commonalities between joy and happiness. They share some of the same things. But joy goes beyond mere happiness. It is uh, deeper uh, than mere happiness. You know, cars rust. Uh, you can buy a brand new car, but eventually it rusts. Vacations end. And we all know that. We have so much fun on vacation. We look forward to it. And before you know it, it's over. Health deteriorates. I mean, we knew that before the coronavirus, but we're seeing that all around us even much more today. Money is lost. Money is lost for a variety of reasons. And loved ones die circumstances change. They change all the time. Like I said before, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse, but they're constantly changing. So happiness often depends on what happens. And we are more happy when good things happen and less happy perhaps when, when worse things happen. But joy is more constant. And joy always sees the silver lining. And by that, I mean joy always sees the hope in any situation that develops. So when I talk about joy being an expression of the heart, we know that it is divine, that it does not depend on circumstances. And here's something else about joy. Joy keeps you faithful. And one of the bedrocks of the Christian faith is faithfulness, of the Christian life is faithfulness. And being in church all of my life, and many of you the same, uh, you know how important faithfulness is. And faithfulness can be expressed in a, a thousand different ways, of course. But faithfulness is something that every mature, fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ uh, always wants to be faithful. And joy keeps us faithful. I want to show you one of my favorite verse verses in the Bible on this subject. It's found in another of Paul's writings, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. And there Paul writes, He who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. Now, it begins by saying, God is faithful. We know from the Old Testament book of Lamentations, it says, Great is thy faithfulness. We know that God is faithful. God is always faithful. He never ceases to be faithful. This verse says, he who calls you is faithful, who also will do it. And it's implied here, I think, that we too should be faithful. Because of his faithfulness toward us, we too should be faithful toward him. So joy is absolutely essential in the Christian walk. Joy is absolutely essential to keep you going in the Christian life, to keep you doing what God wants you to do, and to keep you uh, on point for where God wants you to go and where God wants you to be and how God wants you to develop. So uh, what will keep you going? Joy will keep you going because it is an expression of the heart from the deepest part of every individual 
joy flows. And it flows forth in many ways and is evident to many in many different ways. And it can give you the sustenance and the substance to keep you going. And especially when things really get tough. So it's an expression of the heart. But here's another reason that joy is so indispensable in keeping us going in our Christian walk. And perhaps this one is uh, uh, even a little stronger in some ways than the one we've just talked about. Joy impacts people. Joy impacts people. It makes a mark on people. It says something to people. Uh, it's a demonstration. It's a visual for people. And uh, when you see joy in action, when I see joy in action, when others see joy in action, um, uh, it's something that uh, uh, it just defines itself. Um, it, it is just something that uh, uh, you recognize. It's something that you can see clearly, and it really does make a mark. Let's look in Philippians chapter 1, another verse from that great statement of joy book that he gave to the church at Philippi, and Paul writes these things. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Let me read that one more time. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. Now, you know what? You'll only say something like this when you have joy in your heart because otherwise you'll just quit. You know, things happen to us, things we don't understand, things we are not expecting, things that we don't believe to be fair or equitable. And you know what? When things do happen, and here Paul said things have happened, but I believe they've actually happened. They've actually come forward so that the gospel might advance. They've happened to me, but it advances the cause of Christ. And you won't say that unless you have joy in your heart. I won't say that unless I have joy. You know, you can't say that. So much of the time, people are miserable, even Christians, because that joy does not permeate their heart. It's not deep-seated in them. And so when things happen, they fall apart. Paul didn't fall apart, and he had a lot of things happen to him. I mean, he had too many things happen to him for me to uh, mention right now. I mean, they were numerous and horrendous things even that happened to him. But he felt like every time it was for the furtherance of the gospel. So when I say joy impacts people, looking at this verse, the first thing that we need to notice is non-Christians are impacted. Non-Christians are are impacted. And we know that by reading the very next verse, Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 13. Paul goes on to say, so that it has become evident, it's become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest that my chains are in Christ. Notice, first of all, he talks about the palace guard. The palace guard were the elite Roman soldiers that guarded Nero, the Roman emperor. And these were the same guard that were responsible for holding Paul. This palace guard. So they were not followers of Christ. They were not believers. They had not expressed their love for the Savior. They were under Nero's regime. They were elite guards uh, in his uh, kingdom. And they not only protected him, kind of like our modern-day Secret Service protects the president, they not only protected him, but they were charged with guarding Paul because he was deemed an enemy of the state. Uh, he was looked down upon uh, by the Roman authorities, and they wanted to make sure that they could bring him and would bring him ultimately to an execution so that it became evident to the whole palace guard. You know, to every individual man, I mean, man to man, it became evident that Paul's life was full of joy. So it was evident. And you know what? It was evident that Paul looked upon his situation as 
him being a prisoner because of Christ. He did not play the victim. Instead, he portrayed to those who were close around him that he was only in prison. He was only suffering this persecution. He was only facing death because of his relationship to Jesus Christ. So Paul looked at all his troubles as fulfilling his purpose, not defeating his purpose. How often in life do we get into difficulty? Do I get into difficulty? Do things change and, and we get discouraged and even depressed? And sometimes we wonder, why now? Why this? Why me? And you know, I'm not saying that Paul in the flesh didn't have any apprehension. I'm sure he probably did. He was a man just like me. And, and he had fears just like me. And, and, and he didn't want these horrendous things to come. I'm not saying that. I'm sure he had some human emotion. But ultimately... He was able to keep that human emotion in check because deep down in his heart, he knew he was doing what God wanted him to do. Ever since that day, he was saved on the Damascus Road and shortly thereafter called to be an apostle of God's in his ministry to the Gentiles and even to the Jews. And as a result, uh, his ministry became fantastic and became ever widening. So he knew his purpose was to serve the Lord. And so he understood that now being imprisoned, now awaiting death, he did not look upon himself as being defeated in his purpose and God's plan for his life, but only that it find, found uh, a real purpose. And it wasn't unending or defeating, but it was fulfilling. He did not see himself as a victim, but as a champion. You know, that's something else we hear a lot about in today's world, victims. And there are victims in life. I mean, there are situations where there are true victims. And I understand that, and, and you know that to be true. But many times, people play the part of a victim when maybe that's not the case or they don't really need to do so. And rather than Paul saying, I'm the victim here, I'm the one in jail, I'm the one awaiting execution, he did not see himself as a victim. But he saw himself as a champion. There is another place in Scripture where he writes, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And so I believe Paul saw himself as a champion and as a conqueror. And I'm going to show you a verse on that in a moment. But before I do, let me say that this was evident to the Roman guard. And then in that previous verse that we had looked at, it says, And also to all the rest. So, Paul's joy even extended beyond his captors. All the rest, I'm not sure who all the rest were, but all the rest of those who came into contact with Paul at that time, they experienced the same thing these Roman guards did, that his joy was a big, important part of his life. But he did not see himself as a victim, but as a champion and as a conqueror. Let's look in Ephesians chapter number 6. And Ephesians is also one of the prison epistles or prison letters that Paul wrote. And in Ephesians chapter 6, he says this, For which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. For which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to to speak. So everyone who knew him knew that his joy uh, made a difference. His joy was genuine and it truly and genuinely impacted them. So joy impacts people. Non-Christians are impacted, but also Christians are impacted. They are impacted as well. After those verses that talk about the Roman guard and all the rest, witnessing his joy. We find these words in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 14. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, that's again a reference to his imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So Christians were gaining confidence and courage by Paul's chains, by Paul's imprisonment, 
They didn't want him to be in prison. They prayed that he would be freed from prison. But while in prison, his joy was so complete. It was so strong. It was so full. It was so overpowering to those that came into contact with him that even Christians were gaining greater confidence and more boldness in the faith to speak the word without fear. Now, here's something else I want you to notice, though, that caught my eye when I read this verse. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains. Notice most of the brethren. So you know what? Not all the brethren. There were some Christians that were not uh, helped by this or as influenced by this, or maybe they did not regard this as uh, something that uh, would be beneficial in their life. I don't know exactly what that all means, but it does leave room for some of the Christians not having become as confident and as bold. So even though most did, not all did. And you know that's true in life today. In our church, in every church, in the Christian life, you know, most Christians follow the Lord. Most Christians read their Bible. Most Christians come to church. Most Christians have a desire to serve the Lord. I mean, that's true most of the time. But it's not true of everyone all the time. There are always Christians who shy away from reading the Word, shy away from coming to church, shy away from praying and giving and witnessing and doing all the things that the Christian life is full of. So I hope you're not one of those Christians. I hope you're one of the more and the most and not the least or the few. But you know what? In all of this, having been in prison, being guarded by the Roman elite guard, being witnessed by non-Christians and Christians alike, the bottom line is that through it all, Paul had joy and was entirely selfless. Now, we're going to look at Philippians 1, 15 to 18. This is a long passage of Scripture, but it's important because it shows the selflessness of Paul. Uh, it wasn't about him. It was about his Lord. It wasn't about his life. It was about the life of God and the life of Christ and the life of the believer and the life of ministry. And I want you to notice what he says. He says, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife. What he was saying was, some preach Christ for the wrong reason. Uh, they're not genuine. They're not really sincere. And some also from goodwill. Some do, of course. The former, meaning those who preach from envy and strife, they preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains. Supposing to add affliction to my chains. I think that says that some were looking to take advantage of Paul's imprisonment. He was in prison. Now, you know, they could preach themselves and make a name for themselves in some situations. Some were feeling that way. You know, Paul's put away, you know, he's on the back burner. I can do what I do and people will follow me now. And they had selfish ambition. But notice what he says. But the latter out of love, meaning, of course, some continued in the faith, rightfully so. Knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. So you had two sets of people there. Some preaching with selfish ambition. Some preaching with true love and genuine sincerity. And he acknowledged both. But here's what I want you to really see. What then? Question. Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And then he goes on to conclude these remarks. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. That's a big man right there. That's a big man who could say, you know what? Even the people out there that are taking advantage of my imprisonment, even those who are saying, yay, we've got the stage to ourselves. You know, we don't have to worry about Paul, what he has to say anymore. He even said to those, if Christ is advanced and if the gospel goes forward and if somebody gets saved, I will rejoice. So even those who were at worst enemies of Christ and at best just insincere ministers of the gospel, he along, or he in relation to them and along with those who were faithfully continuing ministry, he said the bottom line is that Christ is preached. So if a guy's out there on the stump preaching Christ, even if he's glad I'm in prison and he has the stage to himself and his ambition is off and his motives are wrong, if somebody gets saved, I'm happy. I'm glad. That's a big man right there. And you know what? As an individual Christian, I too should look at it like that. Maybe I don't always do, but I should. And so in the world today, there are people preaching the gospel 
that I don't agree with everything they say. There are people preaching the gospel that are maybe insincere and not genuine. That's for God to decide. There are people preaching the gospel for any kind of variety of reasons. And then there are those preaching the gospel that I know are genuine and true and that I am faithfully behind and I'm a fan of. But in any case, if the gospel goes forward true and uh, without any error or wrongness and people respond and be saved, then I can rejoice in that, that the kingdom of heaven is built. And you know what? That's really what joy brings to a heart. So, what will keep you going? Same thing kept Paul going. Same thing that keeps any of us going. And joy is one of those things. I'm so glad that you have joined with me today on this subject. And let me just say this. If you do not have that joy, that deep-seated joy that I said is divine, that comes by a relationship with God through Christ His Son, You can have it today. You can be saved today. All you have to do is acknowledge your sin and ask Jesus to come into your heart and save you. He died on the cross. He was buried and he rose again. And he can save you and save you eternally and bring joy to your heart and an everlasting peace and contentment that the world can never take away. And you know, that will keep you going. It really will. I hope you will pray that prayer and invite Jesus to come in today if you have not already done so. And if you have done so, God bless you. And I know that you know as much as I know about joy and how important it is, how it's essential. It's one of those essential things in the life of a believer. Well, again, thank you for being involved in this service today. And being Mother's Day, I want to say again to all mothers, Have a happy, happy Mother's Day. I know things are not like they normally are, but uh, we have a video here for you today that I hope will bring a smile to your face and a little joy to your heart and and, uh, will help you in this wonderful, wonderful day. And to our whole church family, I say again, God bless you. You're so faithful. Keep on keeping on for the Lord Jesus Christ. And one of these days soon, I'm hoping we can all be together here at the church like we were before. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Mother's Day looks a lot different this year. (sighs) Mommy needs a quarantine. And our moms may be spending a lot of time with their kids right now. A lot. Like, so, so much time. And even though they love their kids to the moon and back. Mommy! Where are you going? Sometimes moms need a little alone time. Mommy! You know, to recharge. Go talk to daddy. Mommy! Where are you? But no matter what's happening in the world, their favorite way to spend time is with their family. In good times, in hard times. Mom! Hi. You're breaking everything! In uncertain times. Thank you, Mom, for making time for us every single day. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for today. I ask that you would watch over us as we go to bed and rest, that you would speak to us in Bible stories and speak to us in...